Hi, everyone. Uh, <laughs> we have so many panelists, awesome panelists on this uh, panel, it's probably more than the audience, uh, which is fine because we want to use this actually as an opportunity to talk with each other about what works. Um, so maybe I can get all of the panelists up onto the stage uh, and we can begin. I think we'll add an, another chair or two, if that's okay. And we have also an additional panelist from India. Um, please come and join us. Really like it. it's really jam packed panel. Please notice. Yeah, this is important. Yeah. 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 So I think we're gonna we are gonna film this session, uh, which I think is fine by everyone. Okay, so. Um, it's, it's an absolute honor to be here with this group of people. Um, this session is called Postcards from Around the World and literally the people on this panel are doing extraordinary things in their national um, jurisdictions, in their environments. Uh, I think what we will just start off by doing uh, is doing a quick like literally just my name is and my country so that you get a sense of the geographical spread and you also get a sense of like the names of the people and their identities and maybe even if you want to speak in your na in your native tongue, please go ahead. Um, but um, we often talk as a digital rights community about our problems and there are many of them as we've talked about throughout the day. The focus of this session is actually trying to frame it in terms of solutions, in terms of what's working. Um, for many of us, for many of these people uh, gathered here, actually it can be a day-to-day -day struggle and it can, all, and it can feel like we're, we're losing. We're constantly losing the battle and we're trying everything, sometimes radical, sometimes conservative, sometimes, I don't know, from policy papers to marches on the street to online activism to you name it, a whole range of different activities in order to ensure the defense of, and the protection of digital rights. Um, but what we're trying to do is look at what's working. And I think often people here who are in, often isolated in their own space, not necessarily isolated, but focused on their own space, it's also an opportunity. I would love to have this almost as a private round table as well so that you guys can share. I'm just gonna start off uh, in, after we just do a quick hello, um, we're going to go straight to India because I don't know if the message has spread through the conference efficiently, but in the last um, decision that has been sitting with the Indian Supreme Court for the last two years, but the case has been going on for many, many years related to the, the IT Act in, in India, and the Supreme Court there just handed down an unbelievably positive decision. So we're super excited about that. Um, but let's just, yeah, which we'll hear about, so we're gonna go um, straight to you. But why don't we just do a quick hello and just, yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Carl Stub. I work for an organization called Tactical Tech, and I'm from India. 
I'm uh, Tarek Shalabi, a revolutionary socialist from Cairo, Egypt. Ben Gashasson, Farad Administrative, Nigeria. Hi, I'm uh, Aiber Abraham from Tunisia. I'm a security engineer handler from uh, Actors. My name is Hoi Trin. Uh, I represent Voice, a, a civil society group working on Vietnam. Hello everyone, my name is Miguel. I come from Lima, Peru, and I work in Iper Derecho, a civil uh, society group working on internet rights. Hey, salam alaikum. Uh, my name is Ali, and I work for ASL19, a group that works on Iran. My name is Shagun Belwal. I'm from India, and I'm representing this organization called SFLC.in, short for Software Freedom Law Center, and we work around human rights on the internet. I'm from Pakistan and I work for Digital Rights Foundation focusing on internet freedom. So Shagun, why don't you start off? And I think this is an example of using the courts, right? So the, this is about the petition uh, back in 2012. Now, so the provisions of the IT Act were such that you could get arrested for three years if you send a message online which would be annoying or inconvenient to anyone. That's the language the provision used. So this was filed in 2012, and then there's another thing that we had filed, which was um, leading to intermediary liability online. So what back then it provided for was that uh, an intermediary would be mandated to take down content on receiving a complaint from any private uh, party as well. So we were working with Mouthshot.com, which is an intermediary in India. Yeah. It's, a, so it's a review website, basically. And so we challenged the intermediary liability rules. And just like he said, like in our back, uh, the Supreme Court has declared both those provisions unconstitutional and to be let down completely. So that's, that's great news coming from there in terms of freedom of expression on that. I mean, just to underscore, we're talking about a billion people in India subject to, I mean, the internet population is a couple of hundred million. Talking, talking about basically offensive language could be taken uh, down. And, and 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 sorry, offensive. If, if you be ex if you have been expressing offensive language online, then you, you can be prosecuted. And there are a number of people currently detained as a result of that. And then also the intermediary liability issue here, which is like, when is the platform responsible for the content? Both of those provisions being knocked down is incredibly significant for the hundreds of millions of internet users in India. And it's an interesting use of the court, right? We haven't we, for some of us, we haven't actually. Um, we've, initiated actions, but they haven't necessarily gone to the Supreme Court yet. And it can be a very, very long and involved process. Um, is anyone else here using the courts in terms of uh, So we, we, when surveillance became, mass surveillance became an issue in Nigeria in April uh, 2013, what we did was to start by writing a freedom of information you know, request uh, to government to basically say, uh, because the government wasn't acknowledging that they were doing this, uh, it was an investigative report and they were not going to accept that they were doing it. And so we sent that and our case was struck out of the court because the judge used this phrase, uh, used this word that we're busybodies and we had no you know, rights to ask questions. But we went back to court and I think the, the success from that story is number one, the judge was petitioned. Uh, so this was a judge who clearly uh, was against of expression and was leaning towards security and government and it was petitioned and the good thing is that the the cases that is you know it was involved with after that had a more neutral position because it was very careful because the judicial council did that and the second thing is that because we're spending so we we had about two years when we were told to wait and like you said it's a very very long process so now we're back in court and a decision has not been made in fact we don't think it is going to be made very soon because we're, you know, we have elections this will eleven, and so after that maybe we'll get a date in court. But what that has done is it's put us in a new position that instead of asking the question or saying don't do this, don't do that, we don't like this all the time, we can actually be proactive and decide what we want to do. So yes, we don't want mass surveillance, but what exactly do we want? Uh, and that led to the work that we're doing now on the Digital Rights and Freedom Bill. For Nigeria. So what we've done as an organization is to work with other organizations and say, hey, uh, well, we don't want this, we don't want that, but what do we want? So what do we want? Uh, we've put together in a bill, and uh, so the bill, the first draft of the bill was ready two days ago, and what we're doing now is we're just waiting for the election. So whoever wins 
to go into the National Assembly, we'll approach them, and we're basically saying to them, guess what, you don't have to do any work. We've done all the hard work. We've written the bill. Just take the credit, right? You know, you're the legislator who sponsored the Digital Rights and Freedom Bill for Nigeria. And I think that's very interesting because we have people who have said, I'll sponsor the bill, but they're very careful because they have whether they're going to win um, on April 11 or not. But at least we have a few people who might or might not win. So if they win, then we already have people who already, you know, support the idea of positive rights. Uh, so because, you know, Very, very, it's great when you have a decision like that, but it can be frustrating when you're told you're busy body and you're told your case is going to happen in two years. It's exciting when we have a chance to be able to think to a bill once it's already been passed and seeing prosecutions, etc. Or do we also have the opportunity to create the bill? Right? And I'm really excited to hear that there's this like proactive step that civil society is taking, not only like lobbying legislators, but actually writing model legislation, uh, which is a great, a great thing. I think in the US, um, where we've been doing quite a lot of work as access, we've also been seeing the development of these new cyber bills, information track, and trying to work within the committee and in the legislative process to ensure that the laws that are passed create an environment in which our digital rights are protected. You guys, did you want to jump in on any of that? Yeah, um, as you mentioned about drafting uh, that related to cyber crimes, government uh, has been working on a cyber crime legislation and uh, they come up with the draft a uh, year ago, which was uh, like really draconian. And civil society uh, after rights, they collaborated with international organizations like Article 19 and Privacy International. So they considered the recommendation and uh, the draft uh, because uh, civil society had concerns and uh, government wanted to work on its own. Right now, the thing is that it was very, it was a very successful thing that we worked with the international groups like Article 19. And, um, th they did our capacity building and um, analyzed the law under the national, uh, under the international standards. Uh, but right now, the thing is that uh, um, after a huge terrorist attack in Peshawar on a school, government came up with the National Action Plan of Terrorism. And they said that they are not going to consult any civil society. For now, the most concerning thing for them is to combat terrorism. So this is uh, very, you know, and I think it's around the globe, the trend to look into the laws, drafting the laws under the, you know, national action policies of terrorism. So that's that's a challenge, but there are solutions as well that we are working on right now. So it's interesting that we've talked about judges a few times here <coughs> as well, and I think what we're seeing is that the judiciary actually don't understand how the internet works. Yeah. Um, it's fortunate to hear that the Supreme Court clearly in, in India does have some kind of understanding, certainly of the impact of what these provisions mean in the digital environment and in the offline world. Um, so I I'm just one... wanted to add here that yeah. that's a very good precedent that uh, that has been set by Indian Supreme Court for for a neighboring country like Pakistan, which actually uh, copy pasted the entire IT Act uh, for <laughs> our cyber crime legislation, and we really had a hard time to resist that legislation. So I think that's a very good precedent set by the yeah, and actually as well about what works in terms of civil society action because we know that certain countries and certain regions have greater impact, impact, they set the standard for the region. And we've seen in the European context that, um, you know, the, the data protection, the data retention standards have been copied and pasted throughout Africa, for instance. So we can, you know, if we can have an impact in one jurisdiction, it can influence another jurisdiction. 
I'm interested in this question about judiciary. Is anyone else? Is anyone working on like judicial education? Anyone in the audience or on the panel? Really important um, process that we can undergo because to understand and to interpret legislation it depends on the prosecution and the defence as to what's before them. Often these judges are old, and they need to understand what the rule of law looks like. Uh, in, in the online world, how to have digital due process. Yeah, yeah so I just wanted to add that uh, YouTube is blogged in Pakistan for the last three years because of the anti-Islamic content. So the city took this case before the petition. Uh, it said that the petition didn't go anywhere, but uh, one of the civil society member, uh, she she is working on the canon policy. She became the amicus to the judge, and she am a lot in terms of understanding, you know, uh, cyber issues around the world and also uh, the international standards around cyber laws. So that's really helpful. If civil society and the activists who are actually, you know, know about the subject and also, you know, reach out to the judiciary to, you know, do the capacity building, that's another, you know, option as well. Yeah, I'm going to bring in a beer here because I think many of us are working in different environments, um, some pre-revolution and some post-revolution as well. Abhi, you're from Tunisia. Um, maybe you can just give us a bit of a sense of like how things might have changed since the revolution and how uh, activists are operating in a different space or not, or how legislators are working in a different space with respect to digital rights. Uh, okay, uh, so it's about uh, four years ago, Tunisia uh, the revolution. We uh, ousted uh, a dictator, uh, a dictator uh, under uh, the regime of uh, the former uh, president Ben Ali. Ben Ali. Uh, we experienced uh, a mass of internet censorship by the government, and uh, unfortunately, it was done secretly. Uh, the government blocked a lot of. Uh, websites like uh, Facebook, Dailymotion, YouTube, etc. And I was, uh, I personally, I was affected by, the, by this censorship when I was uh, uh, working as a web, a web developer by trying to, uh, uh, I wasn't, I couldn't use uh, like um, basic functionality by uh, answering YouTube, make or watch, uh, or watch your and it was really frustrating. Uh, also, uh, the uh, censorship cases. In Tunisia, we uh, created a new name for uh, the authority responsible for the censorship. Uh, called the uh, Amar uh, for hundred and a reference for uh, the censored website error message. So, uh, like, um, uh, also, uh, as a web developer, <laughs> like, uh, okay. so just I want to talk, I want to talk about um, uh, the ATA uh, agent. Uh, which is uh, like uh, the Tunisian internet agents who is a uh, mission to uh, promote uh, promote the internet in the country but it was involved uh, to steal credentials by answering hidden JavaScript page and as of the I tried to open code source of those Said that its code was really altered, and here it was a sign of uh, digital dictator. Uh, also, the government uh, uh, used uh, like specialized and spying agents to uh, tap phones and to uh, make deep packet uh, inspection and even to alter some emails. Like, uh, and it was done with no uh, uh, with no discrimination, like randomly. And after the revolution, 
uh, hopefully uh, the internet censorship decreases uh, in the near future. Like uh, because the interim government uh, removed the filters uh, from uh, uh, Twitter and Facebook network uh, uh, networking uh, websites, uh, and that uh, and like after that uh, we have got we have lived an open internet. Uh, when that uh, allow it to uh, flourishing uh, uh, creativity and innovation. Uh, but at the same time, last, last notice, in the same time, uh, after the revolution, uh, the government created a new entity called ATT, uh, Technical uh, Telecommunication Agency, uh, and the pretext to uh, counter terrorism. But there is a lot of worries about the real role of this entity. And uh, we hope not that uh, the government trying to uh, grip a tie, like try to uh, make surveillance uh, for uh, the political dissent and the civil society communities. Yeah. So, um, thanks a lot for that, because we're also going to hear from Tarek as well, who's from Egypt. Um, many people say that the Tunisian story is kind of like the, su the success story of the Arab Spring. Um, and when we talk about what works, is it the revolution? I mean, like we talk about like incremental change, but actually what happened in 2011 was an overthrowing of the government, a throwing out of the, the era 404 regime, um, the establishment of a new constitution and a political process, but maybe depressingly we start to see the weeds kind of growing again and the creation of this new surveillance entity within Tunisia. Let's jump to Tarek and hear from you about in the context of where we are and Alea, the story from this morning and other colleagues in prison like the concerns and the problems of the Arab Spring, maybe what's happened there, but maybe some green shoots as well, some process that might be positive and what has worked either through that initial process or now. It's a lot easier to talk about what hasn't worked for the Arab, Arab Spring, I think. And uh, that's pretty much about everything we tried to do hasn't worked. Um, obviously, we were very, inspi <laughs> very inspired by the, by the Tunisians. We celebrated their independence like it was ours. And it was, it was, uh, it was incredible. And it was very interesting that leading up to the revolution, the president's son uh, who was obviously uh, Mubarak's son, who was one of the leading figures in the leading National Democratic Party. Uh, he had a press conference once, and, and someone from his audience, basically one of his guards, was saying, uh, what are you going to do about the young kids on Facebook and these people, these young revolutionary movements? And then he laughed it off, and the whole room was laughing for, for a few minutes. And then, you know, a few months later, it was those youth who supposedly brought down the regime. Not that that really has happened, but that's what the intention was. And I think it was an indication of how uh, the regime uh, did not see the, the, um, this inter internet as part of, the, of its open policies, open economic policies for the international community to come to and exploit Egypt. Part of it was to build internet uh, infrastructure. And they didn't see that uh, the, the, um, the threat in giving a voice to the people to be able to communicate that way. Uh, that's not to say that the social media is what made revolution e in Egypt or the Arab Spring, like a lot of people were saying. That's not to say that, but it's a tool that they weren't very aware of. And then with time, they started realizing that this is very uh, powerful, and they started actually using it. And because the counter-revolution across the Arab world, but particularly in Egypt, is so organized, they know how to make use of this technology to, so that, to serve their interests. So even though it's us young revolutionaries on the Internet, they're the ones who are organized, who have proper pages, who are communicating, who have proper surveillance, and who know what they're doing, and they coordinate what's going on offline with online. We can talk all we want online and talk about how much we hate the system and, and insult the, the leader and feel like all rebellious and stuff, but we're not getting much done without organization. So I think right now, um, we don't have this um, uh, censorship on the internet, but we do have massive surveillance. And actually, the Egyptian authorities had put up uh, to public a, a request for proposals for IT companies around the world to come and offer mass surveillance solutions and that they were going to choose the best one out there 
Um, and then we didn't hear about what happened afterwards. I mean, they were just so public about their RFP, and then they just went into abyss, and no one heard again, and, and we're all obviously being monitored. And, uh, and so obviously the situation now is very sticky, is, 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 is horrible, because the counter-revolution is back. All of our friends and, and colleagues are in prison. Um, uh, we have a, a military dictator who was uh, kind of the protege of Mubarak in power, and uh, we have a problem that the entire Arab world is facing, is that either go with the military and the brutal, uh, the, the brutal force, or go with the radical Islamists who are just as opportunists and who are just aiming to be exactly like the military and the brutal force. And the revolutionary movements are so weak and non-existent that we're actually left in this binary system and, not, and, we, and we can't get out of it. So that's where we are right now. Okay, awesome, that's really positive. Uh, <laughs> so let's turn to the audience. We've obviously got a whole range of panelists to get through. I mean, I want to talk to, to um, Ali about <coughs> Iran. Obviously, when we talk about dictatorships and regimes and the digital response, um, and Hoi as well from Vietnam, who's also experiencing, who's, uh, who's experiencing Canada in real time. Let's see if there's any questions or any comments from the audience. Uh, just, I had just one small comment to add with the, regards to the judiciary in Egypt and talking about um, education. Um, I'm sure it will agree that uh, it's just not possible to educate the judges because they are, um, you know, uh, elitist and they do not accept any, anyone telling them anything in Egypt. So basically, if you want to teach a judge about the internet and what it really does, you're, gonna, you're just going to be thrown out. So that possibility isn't uh, there, I think. Maybe Tarek can expand. Audience at this point. Um, to the panel. Here we go. Yeah, go, go, for it. go for it. Yeah, I wanna I wanna relate to the thing about the how sometimes it could be hard to educate judges. So uh, we've seen that in Peru as well. But we are taking like a more broader approach, and we say, okay, maybe we are not going to give classes one to one to judges. But why not uh, talking to young lawyers? Why not talking to law students, to young professionals? So we've been starting this this work. It's really, really a, 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 a small work going at class after class, introducing issues like human rights in the internet, uh, ethics and technology, what, uh, to lawyers, to engineers. And, and we hope this will create like a chain effect. Uh, so in the future, in five or 10 years, people on, on really important positions will be sensibilized with the issues that we work on. Yeah. So this idea about investing in the future, like how do we prepare for the, the future leaders? How do we become future leaders and get in power or influence future leaders? And I think we're talking about this at this conference as well as like many startups who are here um, are talking to the big companies, the Yahoo's and the Google's and trying to get a sense of like when they create their terms of service, make it rights respecting now when you have a thousand users as opposed to when you have 10 million users because it's far more difficult when you, you know, when you have that kind of scale and scope. Um, let's move to Ali. Let's hear about the microphone from either side. Uh, let's hear about some of the challenges and some of the solutions in the context of working really with, you know, in the context of the regime and as a diaspora as well. Well, I want to highlight that um, probably you know that Iranian, Iran is under Western sanction. And one of the things that worked in Arcturus was collaborating with Western governments and companies, which is in the spirit of this conference, bringing civil society and companies together to explain to them that some of these sanctions didn't make sense. Some of these services actually were limiting freedom of expression and access to information online. So I small success that uh, we had last year, last February, uh, US government came with uh, exemptions for some of these sanctions and then the other Western uh, governments in the EU and Canada followed. Fortunately, they said, um, there were exemptions on sanctions and uh, many companies reduce uh, or stop over complying with these sanctions and many services are available to Iranian internet users like anywhere, anyone else. Uh, many of those services, simple things that we take for granted. So that's one positive development. Another one, which is again in the spirit of this conference, is uh, our collaboration. Our group collaborates with uh, Cypher, which is a private company 
and they have a very popular psychometry tool in Iran. We collaborate together, we localize their tool, and now the tool is uh, very accessible uh, to users. If they have questions, answers are available. If they need some educational resources, are available. For them. So I just want, unfortunately, we didn't, I, we don't have that access to the Iranian education system. I don't think, unfortunately, it's, uh, we haven't explored that yet. For our collaboration with uh, private companies and uh, Western governments uh, yield to some positive results. Yeah, so it's really interesting here because what we've got are like digital activists who are outside of Iran who are working together with activists inside of Iran, um, trying to influence the tech sector. The tech sector basically <clears throat> working within the conditions set to them by the U.S. government. These U U.S. sanctions that were passed that were just so incredibly like negatively impacting the people they were trying to help. As a result of Ali and a number of other groups, the US government changed its policy, enabled personal communication services not to be caught up by the sanction regime, and then worked very closely with the tech companies like Microsoft, Google, Twitter, and Yahoo to say, it's changed now. You can now unblock your services in Iran, which means the people on the streets of Iran are now using Twitter, Yahoo, I mean, using circumvention tools as well, but using Yahoo and Twitter, etc in ways that they weren't able to do so. So it's a victory, right? I mean, it actually is a victory, and I think we've seen some real movement and um, some, some, certainly some appreciation from people within Iran. Um, but a very, 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 very long way to go, right? <laughs> Tell us about Vietnam and, and what's working there and what's not. Well, uh, unfortunately, Vietnam is nowhere near India or Pakistan or even Egypt or Tunisia, we are very pre-revolution. Um, we only started having really civil society working together four years ago in 2011. And that was thanks to the rise of uh, the internet first. And then uh, income uh, was getting better in Vietnam. And therefore, um, thanks to the rise of social media, civil society started uh, developing. Um, Vietnam is still at an early stage, however, um, there are a few things that have been working or, or continue to work. I could just say uh, one simple thing that five years ago, you wouldn't have right now uh, more than 10 activists uh, from Vietnam sitting in this room being able to leave Vietnam, whereas right now you do have more than 10 activists from Vietnam coming over here. and. Uh, that was thanks to not only um, the rise of the internet, so people know more about their rights and therefore they have less, less fear, but also it connects people. Social media connects people. So now uh, there's a situation where in Vietnam uh, most of our activities are done online, uh, whether it is from a political uh, prisoner, family making a visit and then posting the, the, the visit and the harassment that they they meet right online and then so everyone then can follow um, in, in terms of figure uh, for example uh, right now Vietnam has about 90 million people but we've got 30 million uh, internet users and out of those 30 million internet users we have about 20 million people using Facebook so Facebook becomes a very effective um, tool for activists to not only post um, their thoughts but also where they rally for a common cause. Uh, of course the, the government tries to control and surveillance and persecute people for, for that but it will continue to rise. It rises up to a point where now even the government has to use Facebook. So for example uh, the Minister of Health now has a face Facebook page. And, and thanks to that, therefore, unlike in China, where they can effectively close down Facebook and use an alternative where they can control the, the content, in Vietnam they can't. It, it rises over that tipping point. So I think that is a, a, a great um, thing that is working right now. And because of the online activities that are so vigorous and, and so, um, I would say, so active, it builds to offline activities. So the online activities supports the offline activities. For example, 
uh, two days ago, Hanoi city decided that they're going to cut down 6,700 trees in Hanoi. While people went on social media, went on Facebook and said, no, nah, that's wrong. And guess what? Within like two days, 500 people went down on the street. First time ever for a cause like that to have people going down on the street to protest. Unheard of in Vietnam. But guess what? The, therefore, the Communist Party chief of Hanoi had to stop that policy after like 2,000 trees being cut. So it is all online activities that forces the government to listen uh, that that spills down to the offline activities. So right. those things are working. And it's also working because then people get to know more. We have 4 million overseas Vietnamese who then can help connect with the Vietnamese from inside the country and bring them out here for training and for other activities for advocacy purposes. Awesome. Ali, let's hear back from you about, I mean, we saw Obama and Rouhani like tweeting at each other. And like, how important is the digital space for offline social change within Iran? Is it actually, is there a connection there? Online, so like online action, like these kind of examples that Hawaii talks about where you've got, you know, people activating online that can stop those trees from being chopped down in the middle of Hanoi. I think the best example is probably the 2009 contested election that the Iranians used, like uh, Vietnamese and like uh, Egyptians and Tunisians. They used social media to mobilize and uh, to organize themselves and uh, spilled over from online to, to the streets. But uh, I think when the offline space became very violent and also the online space, the, the authorities were also smart in a way of using that space to identify people. So I think um, it, it had a tampering effect and uh, it, it slowed down on everything. So um, I can't say if it was positive or negative, but I, I just want to highlight that uh, although all these platforms are uh, officially censored in Iran, like Facebook, Twitter, many people use it. And also Iranian officials are on these platforms. For example, Iran's uh, Mr. Foreign Affairs has a verified Twitter account. So that's another um, double standard that the political elite give themselves access to these platforms to reach out, but they don't let the ordinary Iranians have access. And how do Iranians respond to that inconsistency, for want of a better word? Well, many people are online, uh, but, but they have to pay attention. That if they want to come online, they have to use the circumvention to VPNs are very popular, so they have to pay for that. So, I mean, yes, from outside, we see the ones who come online but, and use Twitter and Facebook, but probably a lot of people cannot afford to pay for a VPN on a monthly basis to have access to it. Yeah. So, so Katu, a lot of the work that you do is actually connected to this. It's like, how do people get online and how do they get online safely? Tell us about that. Yeah, so... Well, thanks for being patient as well. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I just uh, just to give a little bit of uh, background about something that happened in India recently. Um, um, in December last year, uh, the Ministry of Communications and IT in India passed a, uh, well, actually issued a secret order to every single internet service licensee in the country and asked them to block 31 URLs, and some of them uh, were popular websites such as uh, github.com, uh, winyear.com, Emotion. Based in, um, and uh, this was issued after a police complaint that uh, said that these platforms were, were being used to incite terrorism uh, in the country. Um, talk about uh, yeah. So it, uh, there's a lot of uh, campaigning going on to try and change legislation. Today we are all really celebrating because. Uh, 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 because of the 66A, especially the Section 66A of the Indian IT Act being uh, struck down by the Supreme Court. I can give you a little bit of background about what that is and actually what's shut in today yeah, in a minute. Right. But uh, um, I think what's important is that uh, there is really very little transparency in terms of how technical uh, how censorship is being uh, uh, implemented or conducted. And something that we did after the blocking in December is uh, did a lot of technical analysis in India and published uh, a lot of these censorship reports. Uh, it is kind of, and because we, there is no transparency, it's important that technologists do get involved and try and look at how 
different kinds. It, it does two things. It uh, one helps us create well create more data sets about what is being censored, how it's being censored, what kind of inconsistencies exist across uh, ISPs in the country when there is no standardized way for the government or, or the judiciary to ask for a takedown or uh, um, uh, or uh, specify or orders of censorship. Um, so it's important to try and collect this data, but also as tool developers, it helps us uh, make circumvention tools better, actually understand what kind of technical censorship is being implemented and how can we actually get around it. Um, there are some amazing tools which basically will let you bypass pretty much uh, any sort of censorship. Of course, a really good, ex uh, the best example for that is probably uh, Tor. Uh, uh, and uh, it, uh, and we found when we were, uh, when we were uh, testing in India that there was nothing that Tor couldn't circumvent. So, uh, but also there's various different uh, kinds of uh, filtering that's applied on circumvention tools, which, uh, and just being able to generate more of the technical data helps us. Uh, right. Can I just better. check who here uses Tor? Who here doesn't know what Tor is? Actually, the founder of Tor is here as well. Uh, Roger Dingledine is not in the room, but he's here. Uh, but essentially, it's a circumvention and anonymity tool that enables you to browse the internet and to communicate online without being identified. Um, and it also enables you to jump the firewall. Um, so, so I mean, uh, Abir, I think you, you, on the digital security helpline, you're recommending Tor as a tool for people to use? Yeah. Yes. Uh, also, uh, in Tunisia, since a lot of uh, websites were censored, like we use it, uh, VPN and uh, Tor to, um, to open this, uh, those um, websites and also for the moment we try to uh, uh, recommend those tools especially for uh, at risk individuals and especially uh, for uh, we are leaving an, an, an insecure communication and um, we need to raise awareness about uh, all those um, yes, digital security tools. Um, let's jump back to India because I want to hear more about the case uh, and see whether we can take some lessons from it. Yes. So, you go first and then. So, so, uh, so yeah, today's landmark judgment, it's, it's making us really happy because some one of the sections of the IT Act that was struck down is a provision called 66A. In the face of it, this specific provision has existed to prevent innocent users from online harassment. Um, it is also extremely vaguely worded. It, you, uh, it, it basically says things like, anything that is offensive, illegal, men, uh, menacing character, or grossly offensive, Annoying, yeah. So all kinds of these really vague terms, which mean, um, basically, yeah, uh, anyone can go, hey, this hurts me because it's annoying me, or this is, uh, this is offensive to me, and and file a file a complaint, and and this is not just content being taken down, but leads to detainment and arrests. Um, and the problem with the 66A has been that it's been heavily abused by politicians over the last several years. One of the uh, uh, one of the one case that caused a lot of public outrage was in 2012 when a powerful politician, Bal Thakre, uh, died and the city of Mumbai was shut down right. after, uh, for a couple of days. And uh, uh, and one of the uh, one of the women who was arrested uh, uh, among the two who uh, uh, basically posted complaining about the shutdown of Mumbai and the other woman liked the post. Actually, both were arrested. The other yeah, one yeah, shared that right. comment, yeah. even she was arrested. Yeah. So someone shared a comment and someone liked that comment and they were basically detained and arrested. Uh, and that's not the first time the 66A has been uh, abused by uh, uh, powerful politicians. Um, and obviously it's, uh, it's been misused and that's the reason that this, the Supreme Court today uh, has decided to strike it down. But also, it's, it, it has curtailed freedom of expression and, in, and, and has been used as, a, uh, as something to intimidate people from being able to express themselves freely on the internet. So it is actually a big landmark judgment. I am not opposed to the idea of laws that prevent people from being harassed, but 
uh, this definitely was not a solution, and this, uh, we've seen it. Uh, we've seen that it hasn't been for years, and um, it's yeah, it's amazing what's happening. Yeah, and when we talk about abuse, the most of uh, the most abuse that we actually saw was coming from the political side. There were a lot of people being arrested for having fled things or posting cartoons, you know, satire basically against politicians. And the next thing you know, they're arrested. So that's where we saw most of the misuse of the as far as the intermediaries are concerned, uh, so we are intermediaries, so the one that I was talking about, the petition that was filed, so they are at present basically uh, fighting court cases throughout India, you know, because everyone is suing them for some sort of, and it's mostly defamation content, and they're being sued all over, so hopefully it's something to help us. Right. Let's throw to the audience. Questions, comments? Yep. Maybe use the mic. You can check to see if that one works. Thank you very much. I'm Ali Akhtar Musari from Iran. And I'm Iranian, based in the United States. I have a comment uh, on uh, Ali's uh, speech about Iran, about the sanctions. Uh, fortunately, we got the general license D1 last year and now we are in this stage that we are trying to share our experience with other communities. At first we reached out to Sudanese, mm -hmm. then Cuban, fortunately Sudanese guys and, and they got uh, recently the license, the same license, Cuban they resolved completely, Obama resolved <laughs> fundamentally, but now we are in North Korean stage. I would like to ask uh, this community if anybody knows this uh, community, we should uh, talk to them and share the experiences that um, they can exempt uh, ICT stuff from sanctions, US sanctions that suffering the citizens. So uh, the other problem for implementing this uh, uh, license is, as Ali mentioned, is about the companies. Unfortunately, some companies just the uh, kind of event and they talk and share their values, but they, do, they don't respond even to the government about the complying with this, uh, uh, and this uh, general license. You uh, witnessed, we sent a lot of letters to, for example, Microsoft. We just see the Microsoft representative just this event. Until next event, we won't get any answer, official answer, but versus this kind of company, we have much more responsible companies like Google, and I would like to thank them. They are they are more responsible, and every day they respond to you. And at least we know that what's their ob obstacles and how can we help them. We understand them, and they also understand that this is the main problem. That some company, um, unfortunately, they don't comply with this uh, uh, licenses, uh, you know, general license that we have. So the last point is that. Even if we encourage this company to go to countries like Iran to invest to, to make theirs in the country, but we warn them, we urge them to be careful if you go you enter to Iran, like previously in China happened for Google, they give you per, permission conditionally if you give the information of the users whenever they want and as much as they want. Uh, so you should be careful about that. And we just want to make sure that this company, they won't uh, uh, actually give this kind of illegal information of the users uh, to uh, the authorities without any you know, legal reason. This is my Thank point. You. Thanks, Mazali. I mean, I think there's a couple of points that have been raised there that are, that are worth highlighting. Um, one is, I, I just want to pay tribute to the point that you made about a lot of work was done to try to influence the US government with its sanctions on Iran. The general license was issued, and then the Iranian community helped to influence the US policy with respect to Sudan. And the Sudan community was successful and helped to lobby the US government on Cuba. And I think that kind of inter-group solidarity can be a really effective tool. Um, Ali, do you want to jump in on any of that? Yeah. Okay. Um, also, with respect to the companies, I think we're also seeing some, like, I remember when I first 
make contact with somebody at Google. It was back in like 2009 after we were working on the Green Movement Revolution. And I wrote to, um, uh, to a friend of mine working at Witness and I said, do you know anybody at Google? And she was like, yeah, I know one person. And it was Nicole Wong who is actually, I think, now the, I don't know, she works in the White House. I think she's the president's advisor on IT. Anyway, and she wrote back to me. And I was like, oh my god, I just got an email from Google. And now I think we see this as every day. Like we have, like there are departments within these tech companies that are now understand the human rights implications of their platforms. That is a, that is a relatively new thing and it's a great thing. Um, so again, I think there's progress there. There's a long way to go. As I mentioned, there are many tech companies who are not here. Um, but now we are seeing progress within the tech companies where they respond to us when we have concerns. They, when we, we've seen their overcompliance on US sanctions, for instance, but they also are here to discuss with us and hear what are the issues that people are facing. For example, real name policy with Facebook is an issue that's still very, very live and will be discussed continuously at this conference. Comments, thoughts? Yeah, uh, about the potential solution, I think, as I said before, we need to raise, uh, raise um, people awareness about uh, physical and uh, risk, uh, physical and moral, moral uh, risks uh, related to um, like privacy security because there is a relation between those two points. Um, and uh, here we have two actors, uh, like internet users and the government. Uh, for the government, for the government, we should, I think, um, push and make pressure, uh, for example, uh, by making online pressure or, um, or trying to um, the um, political parties to educate uh, some um, Tunisian parliament members to be uh, like digital human rights defenders. So, uh, they can help us to write uh, a new uh, digital uh, rights uh, laws. And at the same uh, time, uh, we need to work um, with the internet users by letting them know about their digital uh, rights, um, which, they, which, which digital rights they have and they should have. Uh, for example, uh, we can mention net neutrality and uh, uh, open uh, internet. Uh, also, uh, I think uh, we should uh, let people know how to use uh, their devices with a secure way, and uh, how can how they can uh, be anonymous on the internet and. Uh, uh, encrypt their uh, communication because here there is uh, like a mass of internet surveillance and uh, we need to counter that. Thanks very much. I want to pick up on the issue of terrorism because it's being mentioned four or five times. Nika, well, how, what is the solution to this problem? I think we're seeing it everywhere. How do we actually work towards the respect for freedom of expression and privacy and association online in the context of counter-terrorism, which is being used by governments across the world, and particularly in your country? Well, I don't think so. I don't, I don't see any solution to it right now, because uh, in Pakistan, this uh, narrative around um, national security and terrorism, and I can see in other countries as well, it's actually increasing. And um, I, I would like to talk about the role of companies uh, when uh, these governments send them uh, take down requests and asking for users' data. They actually um, uh, cite national security and anti-terrorism uh, anti policies. And these companies, most of the companies comply to them. But I think the only solution I see is to interact more with these companies. And I think these are the rights phone and the other conferences. These are the spaces where digital rights activists and organizations working on internet freedom, I mean, they can interact with them and tell them that what actually they mean by law and national security and terrorism. And 
most of the time they say that it's a blasphemous content and in pakistan we have seen that on facebook a lot, lot of pages were removed by the company because it was the political content and by the uh, political activists and descendants so i think it's it's really important to interact with these companies and the you know, you know their policy teams that what actually government mean when they cite these laws and uh, but it's a growing and increasing narrative which is like um, we feel really hard to challenge yeah, I just want to add, add to that. In Egypt in the 90s, uh, the word terrorism uh, was very widespread and was used by the media a lot. And obviously back in the 90s, we still didn't have internet. And uh, regular landline TV, which everyone got, had the same rhetoric. And it was very controlled and very centralized. Uh, now, after the revolution, after the Muslim Brotherhood were ousted by a military coup, and they're all thrown in uh, prison, uh, this terminology is back again. And a lot of Egyptians are sucking it up. And it's true. However, I think uh, we, the authorities will never serve us. Uh, we will never get to the point where they're going to do us a favor. If we, if we want our rights, we're going to be do, pressuring them, and they're going to be doing it uh, in, despite the fact that they don't want to do it. Now, I think the best way to get rid of that, obviously, is to, to um, empty this word of meaning so that it no longer has any meaning for the people. So when they say terrorism, it's like, oh, well, it's, it's bullshit. It's what they're saying all the time. It doesn't mean anything. So in, in, in that sense, what we're trying to do here is you're trying to reach out to the people and to say, hey, you have the military who is throwing everyone in prison, is cracking down, they're raising prices, they're controlling the economy and the ministries, we have no freedom whatsoever. And then you have the Islamists who are just like them, they just have beards, right? And those are the two groups that you have available. How about this? I'm talking about minimum wage, about uh, progressive taxation on the rich, about services and health for the poor. And these are the things I want to talk about. Now, I don't care about terrorism or what have you. These are the things I want your everyday life to be better. Now, the, the thing is, we can't get access to TV. It's very controlled by a small group of businessmen. We can't get access to the radio, which is controlled by the government and by, by the army. You can't get access to the billboards, which is controlled by millionaires who are siding with the military for obvious reasons. However, and I hate to sound like Orientalist, but the, the social media is a, a, a platform uh, like Facebook, at least, in Egypt, is a platform that we can use. We have 25 million users in Egypt on Facebook. The next, pre next president of Egypt can have his, his or her campaign, his or her, as if uh, her is a possibility, campaign on Facebook, and he or she can win the elections purely by Facebook campaigns. Now, what I'm trying to say is we've lost the, the struggle to control or to reach out via any sort of media. However, alternative media, basically Facebook in Egypt, is the one tool that we can use. And in order to use that, we obviously need to work together because the counter-revolution is using it just, just as much. All the ministries have Facebook pages, all the army, the president, everyone, they all have Facebook pages and they're very active with it. Uh, we as political, uh, political groups and as activists and, and youth and revolutionaries need to be using that to reach out to the people and say, hey, you know, the hell with the Islamists, the hell with, 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 the, with the army, Let's talk about your rights. Let's talk about moving forward with this. Thanks. And it's interesting. You, you kind of sound like a cyber, cyber utopian in a way. It's like that the solution to all of these issues in the context of the radio, the print, and the television being controlled is Facebook. Right? And the Facebook guys are here. But we've also talked about the context that Facebook's a private company which is you know, responsible to its shareholders after an IPO. And like, so how do you reconcile that as as a revolutionary socialist? I, I never thought you would ask. That's a good question. <laughs> Facebook In a minute, because I also want to give people an opportunity to close up Yes, well. if Facebook is one of the companies you want to get rid of, right? So when the revolution uh, succeeds, we want to get rid of Facebook, we want to get rid of Google, we want to get rid of all these sons of bitches and make the 1% who are controlling every aspect of our lives and yeah, are siding with armies and the militaries and whatnot to crush us because we're asking for bread freedom and social justice. However, in order to get that, we need to work step by step and so what we're doing is we're using the tools available. So right now we can use Facebook. Once we have a true open source Facebook, or we're gonna to torch the hell out of Facebook and we're gonna be able to use our tool. And you know what, with a billion people on Facebook, hell, this should be ours. It shouldn't be, should have belonged to a bunch of rich businessmen who control our information, make money out of it. It should belong to the people and we should be using Facebook because it's ours. Awesome, thanks very much. I knew we invited you for a reason. Benga, let's hear from you. You know, so it's it's interesting that um, and put that iPad away. I didn't get that. <laughs> you know, so you've got you've got people who already use this 
um, anti-terrorism laws uh, to clamp down. But I think we've got a group of countries that are in transition. Uh, that's about the place where Nigeria is, where we don't, now we have an anti-terrorism law, but it's about now that government is using the excuse of, and it's always excuses. It's not because government wants to make the country safe and secure. It's just the excuse that yes, there's terrorism, there's Boko Haram in the north, uh, so let's let's do the things we want to do. So we've got a chance. Um, the good thing is we knew they were coming, and so we 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 made sure we were in the room when the conversation was happening. And every time we were at the national assembly and the conversation went towards terrorism, we also talked about rights. And one thing that was helpful was that when the conversation was always about terrorism they thought as government people who would always be there. When you pointed out to them that if you start mass surveillance today, when you're no longer the president or when you're no longer a politician, you will be a subject of surveillance, you should see the reaction on their faces because they literally go like, wow, is, is that going to happen? And that has been a, been a bit helpful in having the conversation. So for, for countries in transition, I think this is the time not to allow anyone to blackmail you emotionally. Because the thing was always that when you had any conversation, people asked me questions like, are you in support of terrorists? And, and the, I think it's important to push back and say, this is not a conversation about me supporting terrorists, but it's about a two-way conversation. Yes, there is a security you know, question and there's a security conversation, but at the same time, there is the fact that I have a constitutional right to my privacy. Uh, so we've we've got a chance to have that kind of conversation right now. Uh, unfortunately, it's it's tilted more towards government. Um, so we had we had a regional meeting recently where uh, someone from a government, Ghana, you know, by the way, which is seen as more open than many other governments in the region, actually talked about security and said, if you have nothing to be afraid of, why are you so worried about you know limited freedom? And my response was very simple: if there is no agenda then why are you so concerned about helping me protect the kind of things I say in the name of security? And so, so I think that there's some countries like Nigeria and others that have the chance of having this conversation right now. But the reality is the conversation between security and rights and freedom is not balanced. In fact, what we need to do is to have a lot more conversation around rights and freedoms to even have anything close to a balance in this you know, kind of two-way conversation. I mean, I mentioned this before in the government's meeting that happened earlier today, is that in many governments, the decisions are still being made. Like, we think about, I mean, in some governments, it's, it's, it is kind of monolithic, perhaps in, in Vietnam and in Iran, but there's still, like, progressives, there's still moderates, even in, actually, in Iran and Vietnam. So decisions are being made, and then there are also distinctions between, like, agencies as well. So sometimes we've been in meetings where we sit with the, the person who's responsible for human rights and the person who's responsible for cyber. And those two people often have never met each other. But it's often the person who's the cyber guy, who's like, and is generally a man, who's like got all the arguments and got all the statistics and is able to like, like basically obliterate the human rights person or the human rights advocate. Often it's a debate within government as to get getting, before they get to that policy. I really take your point about transitional states or transition, like we are at a moment of transition. Uh, there are norms that are being built right now in all of our countries. Uh, even in Australia, where I'm from, we're seeing government, the government making decisions on data retention, which are absolutely like crazy. Um, and it's all, again, in the name of national security and the protection of borders, etc. But those decisions are being made right now and I, I'm, I'm really glad to hear um, what you said because I, I think that what, we're, what we need is good argument. Like we actually need really smart, good, incisive argument based, as Katsub said, on data as well. Like we need data, we need information which actually identifies what is taking place in the digital environment, what sort of censorship there is, and then to be able to provide that as part of our arguments so that we can tip the balance. So let's move to a beer because your balance is the balance is you know undecided in, in Tunisia as well. You mentioned that we have, and I think this conversation is somewhat turning to terrorism, but I'm I'm pleased that it is because I think that we do this is like the defining feature. I think when we looked at what happened after Charlie Hebdo, you know, on one hand you had all of this, the heads of state walking down the street arm in arm, 
talking about freedom of expression, and at the same time they're instituting uh, counterterrorism laws through the parliaments. So like, how do we get to this point where we tip on the side of rights as opposed to on the side of, of, of counterterrorism? Any perspective in this final round? Yeah, I think that uh, the government always use uh, terrorism excuse or argument for survival. I think that they we need uh, an institution like control every um, like surveillance uh, the government or or uh, like uh, try to uh, to make for. Um, for uh, a target or like we need some control someone control uh, those uh, surveillances uh, because uh, if we stay uh, here uh, just uh, listening about uh, surveillance uh, without uh, doing anything uh, like uh, uh, the things are going to be uh, like before and, uh, and just to pick up on that, I think this idea, Benga, which you mentioned before about infrastructure, basically what you're saying is we're creating this surveillance infrastructure that can be used against you. Once this surveillance infrastructure is in place, whether it be legally or technically, we're in a place where it's extremely hard to roll it back. Do we need uh, like legal text or uh, laws about uh, uh, those actions that the government are making. Uh, we need laws to protect uh, internet users, activists, so um, so we can defend if the government try to uh, like jail it someone or so we need like uh, uh, focusing a lot of uh, those things and um, uh, and trying to uh, build strategies. Okay. Mike, do you want to finish up on some of the things that have worked for you in the, in the terrorism context or otherwise? Right. Uh, I think that Vietnam is still at an early stage and Vietnam actually doesn't need to talk about terrorism before it can silence dissent. Uh, if you are found guilty of uh, conducting propaganda against the state, then you're thrown in jail. So you don't even need terrorism per se. However, despite all the difficulties, uh, I think that there are still enormous opportunities because of the rise of the internet, the rise of social media, and especially also because of the fact that never have Vietnamese or even Chinese uh, gotten such a great chance of learning what's happening around them. Uh, not just online, but of also offline. I give you 10 years ago, if you travel from Saigon, you fly from Saigon to Manila, it would, it would cost you $600, a return ticket. Now, it will cost you 150 bucks on Cebu Pacific. I'm just mentioning it because not only that it's online activities that are now cheaper, easier to use, it's not just Facebook, but it's through Skype, Viber, WhatsApp, you name it. It's much easier for people to connect not just with each other, but also between countries. For example, Vietnam, because it joined the ASEAN, now Vietnamese can travel uh, within ASEAN without needing a visa. So that is an, an enormous opportunity for Vietnamese and other nationalities to get together and, and overcome all the problems that they, they face with the government. So yes, it's difficult, but there's also um, yeah, some really great light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, hi. Uh, hi. Yes. Uh, well, in Peru, we, we do have some really broad anti terrorism laws, but usually what is being used uh, in order to introduce surveillance or in order to introduce, in order to make us lose some digital rights, is uh, the argument of security in, as a general. Uh, so I, we always raise like two points. The first, of what, the first one is to advocate for uh, evidence supported uh, policy. And uh, many of these ideas about collecting all kinds of data or uh, surveil, surveil, introducing massive surveillance, they do not hold that, they do not have like uh, case studies where they've been able to prove effective against, you know, uh, security incidents. 
uh, and on the other hand, you, you need to be able to have a well-educated public that is aware of what it is that they are losing when they are do, doing this trade-off against losing uh, their privacy, against uh, getting more security. There, are, there, there may be some, some particular cases where that trade-off is, is valid, but as a general point of view, if people, if they are able to understand what they are about to lose, they should, they should be much more resistant to this kind of policies. And the tension between uh, national security and individual security or individual rights, I want to encourage everyone to collaborate with David Kai, uh, UN Special Rapporteur on uh, Freedom of Expression. Uh, I, I used to think that UN was just talking and nothing would come out of UN, but I've seen great work coming from uh, UN Special Rapporteurs, Frank Leroux and uh, the new uh, uh, Rapporteur, David Kai. I also want to mention that we have an election coming up in Iran next March, like about a year from here. Every time an election comes up, it's like a testing place for the best method of control and best method of circumventing them. I think Iranian government is going to deploy their best techniques. And if you know, or if you're involved with good tools or good data that would help us to um, mitigate or to, what's the word for you deploy DPI and then you, it's KPI. KPI? Yeah. So they deploy DPI and we, uh, if, you, if you know of good methods of circumvention or uh, you have access to network data where it would help us to document uh, information control, I'd like to hear from you and come help us for the next election. So apart from the judgments, which is the news for today, I I want to say that uh, as far as surveillance goes, I think there needs to be a little more transparency. So at least we know what what is. I, I understand the risks of that, but we at least the uh, the entities that are involved in this, they need to have some sort of legal sanction, and we need to know a little more. And like you said about the censorship, there is absolutely no transparency even there. So I think even that is an area of concern. As of now, if a website is blocked and you go there, you, you visit it, all it says this is being blocked pursuant to orders from the Department of Telecommunications. So I think we need to know a little more about why this was banned in the first place and uh, the reason. And so, yeah, just a little more transparency what I'm looking at from censorship and so. Thank you. You got? Uh, I think I have already shared my thoughts around terrorism, anti terrorism narrative. And, uh, but I just want to um, mention that. Uh, I think more collaborations and partnerships are needed among, uh, you know, uh, activists who are working in the country and international organizations and the foreign governments who are supportive to the idea of internet freedom. So more collaborations, more partnerships, and that's much needed and to bridge the gap. Yeah. You know? Thank you. I mean, I've just been scribbling down a couple of things here along the way. I know we've had a very wide ranging conversation on, on a number of different issues, but here's some of the things we've come up with. So. Pressure, uh, sorry, international pressure and collaboration, um, transparency of surveillance and censorship, using the UN system, including the special rapporteur, um, educating the public about their digital rights, uh, regulation and good laws, the creation of them, challenging them when they're bad, using the courts, um, digital rights awareness, um, freedom of information acts, judicial education. Uh, writing policy ourselves and creating good legislation which we can provide to talking to young lawyers and, and young professionals including the startup community using Facebook if you believe in it uh, <laughs> using Facebook and other online tools for activism engaging the diaspora technical analysis and exposing processes and data collection for tools creating good arguments that you can use in, in uh, lobbying and advocacy um, and engagement deep engagement with the tech companies so on the basis of all of those strategies, let's use them going forward and let's have a round of applause for the panel.